Hey, did you know that in statistics, we make assumptions? In fact, we make four assumptions. Normality, which we don't really care about. Homoscedasticity, which we care about a little bit. Independence, which we really care about. And linearity, which we also very much care about. Let me show you why. Let's say we have data looking at the relationship between radiation dosage and cancer biomarkers. And maybe we perform a regression model and find something that looks like this. Ooh, pretty. Yay. And from this model, we might want to conclude, oh my goodness, more radiation means more cancer. I ain't doing your stupid radiation. I don't want to die. Just before we publish that paper, we think, hmm, maybe it's better to visualize this. And so we do. And my golly, what do we find here? Well, if we look at our residual dependence plot, it tells us that we have violated the assumption of linearity. Big mistake. This assumption is super important because when we fit linear models, you notice the word line and linear? That's because with linear models, we always assume there's a straight line relationship between the predictor or predictors and the outcome. And if the relationship between the two is best described by something that is not linear, yeah, we're gonna make some false assumptions like this that increasing radiation always increases cancer biomarkers. Let's look at another example. Let's say we're studying the relationship between one's RIS, and for those of you who are not as current on lingo as I am, RIS is short for charisma, which has come to mean you are really appealing to the gender for which you are attracted. Two. Yeah. Basically, you're a ladies man if you're a heterosexual dude. So let's say you fit a model between Riz and perceived attractiveness. And again, we look at the regression summary and find, wow, more Riz means more attractiveness. Makes sense. Yay, I'm done. Publish that sucker. But again, let's see what happens when we visualize this. And what do we find? Again, there's some curve of linearity going on. Now, in this case, it wasn't as bad as the last case where uh, we would kill people but our model does suggest something that is wrong, that increasing RIS always increases attractiveness at a constant rate when that's not the case. So how do we address this? Fine question, Nat. There are four proven ways you can fix the linearity in your model. Four ways that I can come up with off the top of my head. So the first way is to use polynomial regression, which I'm gonna show you, and it's easy. Second way is to do a log transformation, which is easy, and I'm gonna show you that too. Third way is to use generalized linear models. I'm not gonna show you in this video, but I can link some videos in the description for doing generalized linear models. And the fourth way is to do nonlinear regression slash Bayesian regression. I lump them in because the strategy is very similar, and it's really, really hard to do, and I don't have any videos on this. If you're interested, maybe I'll do it sometime. So let's go ahead and step into R and see how we're gonna do that. <laughs> Boom! I'm in R. So here's my linear model. I'll just show you what I showed you before. Summary model. Summary of the linear model. We find a statistically significant radiation effect, yay. But then we visualize it and oh my dear goodness, we done find something wrong here. Yep, we have a clearly curvilinear relationship and we fit a straight line. So to fit a polynomial regression, it's actually pretty easy. All you do is take the existing model that you had before. Actually, I'm gonna put them right next to each other so you can see the difference easier. There you go. All we're gonna do is we're gonna add this right here. Sorry about the technical difficulties. Let's get back into R. Where we left off was we fit this polynomial term by adding the I and then radiation tilde two. And if we were to fit that and hit summary, it would give us some information. And this right here is telling us that it is statistically significant. The polynomial term is statistically significant, but I don't care about that. I wanna see it. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and visualize this and like that bigger. And wow, in the words of Owen Wilson, wow, that looks pretty good. Man, actually, that looks, that looks really good. That uh, curve is right in the center of the data. We got some positive skewness in the residuals. I'm not worried about that. My head's in the way, so you can't see. The residual dependence plot looks excellent. <laughs> So let's go ahead and look at some estimates now. So I'm gonna do estimates, which is a flexplot function. Look at polynomial 
regression. Um, if I look at the estimates, then we got a model R squared of 0.37, which is pretty good, I guess. And then we got semi-partial R squares. So um, if we were to partition that 0.37 into the individual components, so radiation, it explains almost 6% of the variance and the polynomial term alone explains like 31% of the variance. That's really impressive. Um, now, I wrote a blog post once that I'll link in the description about whether that actually makes sense. Actually, I think it was in the context of interactions, but it would be the same here. Does it actually make sense to look at a semi-partial R squared for an interaction term or for a, um, in this case, polynomial term? And uh, the problem is that sometimes if you have a very strong linear trend of the main effect, and then even if you have a pretty large interaction effect or even if you have a pretty large polynomial effect, it can be overshadowed by the linear trend. And so it'll end up looking smaller than it actually is. Um, but we actually, in some ways, have the opposite here. That if I were to visualize the polynomial regression, we saw this before, but we'll look at it again. Um, relative to the linear trend, the polynomial is much bigger. And so we see that reflected in these estimates. So I think at least in this case, um, you can look at that and say, yeah, that polynomial is huge. Now you might be asking yourself, why does that work? Well, if I can uh, remind you of um, algebra, for me, that was middle school. For you, maybe it was high school, I don't know. Anyway, um, we know that uh, the equation of a line is equal to y equals mx plus b. And I've already talked about that in statistics. Basically, that's what we're doing with stats is we're fitting a line. But we also learned that y is equal to uh, x squared gives us a polygon. And so what we're actually doing here is we're combining the two. We're combining a straight line with a polygon. And that's why we end up getting this or this sort of thing, depending on whether it's positive or negative and that sort of thing. So that's all we're doing. Pretty cool. So now let's go ahead and look at the other problem. So here we have our model where we are predicting attractiveness based on one's riz. Uh, that reminds me. So over the weekend, I was talking to a good friend of mine who happens to be gay. And in the middle of talking to him, he called me hot. And um, so I'm straight. But is it weird that I found it oddly flattering that a gay dude called me hot? I wonder what that means. Anyway, back to R. So if we fit that model, we'll look at the summary again and say, wow, Riz is statistically significant, yay. And then we visualize it and say, oh no, we got the wrong model. Because look at that fitted line. It is making predictions that are negative when the attractiveness scale doesn't even go negative. So we know that's a bad model and our residual dependence plot here shows us we've got some bend in the data that we didn't fix. So I'm going to try to fix this with a polynomial. It's not gonna work, um, but I'm gonna try to fix it just to show you the limitations of a polynomial model. So back in here, I'm going to do as I did before and say Riz, but I'm going to add the polynomial term plus I times Riz squared. And then I'm gonna visualize this model and see how that looks. And if we look at that model, that's better we still in the residual dependence plot got this kind of curvilinearity going on. And the other weird thing that's happening is that at the beginning, we can see the data points are asymptoting. Asymptote means that there's a line that kind of levels off at a particular value. And so we want a model that is flat on one end and then curves up, but this goes like that. So that's a problem. That's one of the limitations of polynomial models is they're always going to bend in both directions eventually. They, they aren't able to asymptote like that. And so if you have a situation like that where the data clearly suggest a pattern where there is an asymptote of some sort, uh, polynomials aren't going to do any good. So instead we're going to do a log transformation. And so to do that, I'm going to create a new variable called hot logged. Um, didn't realize until now that Sounds like hot dog. <laughs> That's awesome. Hot logged or your hotness score or attractiveness score logged. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to say hot logged is equal to log of D dollar sign attractiveness. So I'm taking your raw attractiveness score and then taking the log of that. And then actually, I'm going to go ahead and show you what that looks like. If I go flex plot attractiveness tilde one data equals D. This will show a histogram of what attractiveness looks like. And if you look down here, it's severely positively skewed. But now if I go uh, hot logged, I will get something that is actually really normal. So that's what a log transformation does is it takes something that is skewed and then sometimes not always, it doesn't always works, but sometimes it'll normalize it. 
And if you want to learn more about transformations, I made a video and I will link that in the description. So now we're going to go and model the logged version of our model. Hot logged. And we'll call it mod logged. I spelled logged wrong. And instead of correcting it, I just decided to perpetuate my error. That's how I roll. Visualize mod logged. And then if I zoom in on this one. Whoa, that looks amazing. All the problems that we had before are gone. So now we have a uh, relationship between Riz and hot logged that is very much linear. Um, and the residuals look great, or the histogram of the residuals looks great. Residual dependent plot has some wonkiness, but it's in the tails. And if it's in the tails, I usually don't worry about it because that usually means it's an outlier problem and the residuals look flat. And by the way, um, if you're not familiar with what I'm looking for in these plots, I will also leave a link in the description about how to interpret diagnostic plots. So yeah, that completely fixed the problem, but there is a cost. If I were to look at summary mod logged, and if you were to look at this, um, your inclination might be to say, all right, for every one point increase in your RIS score, we expect your attractiveness rating to go up by 0.85 points. And that's not the case actually, because this is on a log scale. So what that actually means is a one point increase in RIS changes your uh, attractiveness on a log scale. So it's a 0.85 increase on a log scale. And unfortunately, it's really hard to think in terms of logs. Um, under some conditions, you can turn those into percentages, but I'm not going to worry about that here. If you're interested, I will leave a link to, uh, I believe it's in my Poisson regression model where we talk about changes in percentages. Um, I'm not going to worry about that here, though. But that is the cost. Uh, you can still interpret R squared. Um, actually, I should probably do uh, estimates of this one. Estimates mod underscore logid. Logid. Uh, yeah, we got a really impressive R squared, 0.66, uh, correlation of 0.81. Um, and again, um, that is to be interpreted on a log scale. So, anyway. So, that was a very quick and dirty two methods you can use to try to fix a nonlinearity problem. And just to review, basically you can add a polynomial, which works great for some situations, but the, if there's any sort of asymptote, it's not gonna work very well. Uh, the other option is to do a log transformation. And log transformations are great when you have an asymptote, um, and sometimes they fit like really well. But the problem with them is then um, the regular slopes are a little harder to interpret, because then you have to interpret them on a log scale but uh, maybe that's worth it. And like I said, there are alternatives to doing this. There, you can do generalized linear models. I'll leave a link in the description. And if you guys really ask me nicely, I might do a video on nonlinear regression slash Bayesian. I'm kind of lumping them in because the strategy is the same, uh, where basically you have to come up with your own mathematical function and figure out how the residuals are distributed, which is really hard to do. Um, if you're interested, um, and you twist my arm extensively, uh, I might do a video on that, but it's tough. So I hope you have enjoyed this video. If you want to support me and or take a class from me, I invite you to visit simplistics.net where you can take a class from me, either a self-guided class, which is going to have basically anything you would have. It's, it's the curriculum that I use for my university students where you get learning objectives, you get a detailed schedule links to course videos, you get discussion boards, you have interaction with me and have interaction with students, you have quizzes, you have exams if you want to take exams, that sort of thing. Um, everything's there that you need for the self-guided course. You also have live courses that you could choose from where once a week you get to meet with me via Zoom and we get to practice together and you get to ask questions and I'll answer questions and we'll just hang out, have fun. So hope to see you in one of our classes. Thanks for tuning in and we'll see you next time. Peace out.